Hello everyone, this is Homer White with some tips on how to make a very nice looking data analysis report like the one you see before you using the R Markdown system. First of all, log in to R Studio and then ask to make a new R Markdown document. You will go to File, New File, specify that you want an R Markdown document and give it a nice title. This is also your chance to enter your name. Then decide upon the format that you want. We'll produce PDF documents. A skeleton document comes up. You can edit the title and the author and the date whenever you like. The initial code chunk is a very important one where you should load any packages that you know that you're going to need during the production of your document. You can also set some global options using the knitter package. I'm going to get inside this code chunk and ask for tiger stats since I plan to use some of the Tiger Stats data in this report. I'm also going to use a couple of functions from the Knitter package, so I'll go ahead and load that package as well. The ops chunk set here is from the Knitter package, but since I'm loading the Knitter package, I don't need to call the package explicitly. I'll go ahead and take off the beginning of that command. And the way I'd like to set my options is so that the code never appears within my document. I simply want the code to be run. So I'll go ahead and set this option echo to be false. We'll explain that more in a little bit. The code chunk you see here, include equals false, simply means that this code will run, but no messages will appear inside the R Markdown document as a result of running this code, and also the code itself will not appear. The setup here was a name given in the skeleton. You can name code chunks, but in practice you won't have to. The rest of the document is a sample of what an R Markdown document can be like. We're going to go ahead and erase that sample. And we'll put in the skeleton of our report. We want to have sections and subsections. Sections are given with a single hashtag, then a space, and then the name of your section. So let's type in a few of our sections. Some of our sections will have subsections. A subsection is given by two hash marks, then a space, and then the title of the subsection. If you want sub subsections and further on down, you just keep on adding more hash marks at the beginning. Once you have your document lined out, then it's time to start filling in your text and the code chunks that will produce the tables and graphs that you need to talk about. You type your text pretty much as with an ordinary word processor. Okay, I've typed up my introduction. Before we take a look at it, let's go ahead and save our document in the proper place. So we'll ask to file, save as, and we should save into our submit folder. We should use whatever naming protocol has been specified for this assignment in this case data analysis report underscore draft underscore my username dot rmd you may have some other protocol that's been specified for your class save once we've saved our document we can knit it up let's see what it looks like now as you can see, we have our section heading, 
we have some regular text. Notice that some of the text has been italicized. How did this happen? Also, notice that we have bullet points. We want to find how that happened. Some text is also in typewriter form, like Tiger Stats here. We want to know how that happened. Some text is boldface. How did that happen? Let's take a look. To get text in typewriter form, like Tiger Stats here, you simply put a back tick before and after the word that you would like in typewriter form. The back tick is underneath the Twiddles key towards the upper right hand corner of your keyboard. If you want to italicize words or phrases, like the Digest of Education Statistics that you see here, simply put an asterisk before and after the phrase. If you'd like boldface, like the names of these variables here, then simply put a pair of asterisks before and after the word or phrase that you want in boldface. If you would like bullet points, you can get them. I've got a couple of different bullet points here. Here's a set of bullet points. Here's another set of bullet points. To get your bullet points, you're going to want to make sure that you have a blank space, at least one blank space, between your previous text and your set of bullet points, and at least one blank space after your bullet points and the following text. Then you produce each bullet point with a single asterisk, then a space, and then the item that you want bulleted. Then on the next line, a single asterisk, another space, your second bullet item, and so on until you're done with your bullet items. Let's now type in the methods section. I've just typed in a little paragraph of text into my methods section, but it's time for me to produce a little code chunk. It's a good idea to have at least one space between text and the beginning of a code chunk and at least a space between text and the end of a code chunk. So create a new space and then I add a code chunk. Remember there's various ways to do this. You could go to insert chunk but notice there's also the keyboard shortcut control alt i on a Windows machine. I think I'll follow that idea. Control alt i Alright, I'm going to put in my code. Alright, I've typed in my code chunk. I'd like to knit this up and just see what it looks like. This is a good idea to keep knitting up your document as you go, to make sure everything's correct, make sure your code runs, make sure it looks like you want it to. Text looks okay. Graph looks a little bit big. Not only is the graph a little bit big, but I'd like to see a caption for this graph. How can we accomplish these things? At a certain point, you'll want to go and modify the settings for your R Markdown document. You can find the settings at the little cog next to your knit button. For each of the possible formats, you can set options. I'll look just at the PDF for now general options. So if you'd like a table of contents you can say so here. You can specify the depth here. If you want to number the section headings in your table of contents you can click this box if you like. Syntax highlighting you can choose your favorite. Default is pretty good. About those figures. By default they're set to be pretty large. You can play around with the default width and the default height. So for example, maybe you'd like a width of four and a height of three and a half. It's also nice in a PDF document to choose to render figures with captions. I also like the, the cropping option that's available by default. There are other more advanced options that you may choose to play around with later. 
say OK. And let's knit again. This looks better. The graph is smaller, but still readable. And there's a nice caption underneath. When we turn back to the Source R Markdown document and look at the YAML front matter at the beginning, we can see that the output options that we chose using the GUI have been recorded for us. Fig cap is yes, fig height is three and a half, fig width is four. We're told to number sections and produce a table of contents. So the output options GUI takes care of that YAML front matter for us. There is the matter of how we got that caption. You can get figure captions whenever you like by using the fig.cap argument inside the chunk options. So my first and only chunk option for this particular code chunk that produced the uh, xy plot was fig.cap. And I set it equal to a long paragraph that you'll notice is in quotes. This is important. Your caption needs to be in quotes. Also, when you set a fig.cap, then the figure will get a number, and then you can refer to that number in the text. That's important because in PDF output, quite often the figure can be placed far away from the text where you plan to discuss that figure. So keep track of your figure numbers and how you refer to those figures. Let's continue typing. I have here a paragraph discussing the idea of confounding variables. Let's knit this up and see what it looks like. You'll notice that in this paragraph, some of the letters are in script form. That's mathematical notation. How do you get math in our markdown? To get mathematics, all you have to do is enclose the text that you'd like to be mathematical between two dollar signs. Let's type some more. We finished our method section. It's time to look at the results. Let's work on the first subsection. And the last subsection. Remember, keep knitting as you go to check your work. We're ready for our conclusion and discussion. Finally, the references. We had one we wanted to show to the reader. Let's knit up the final version of the report, especially looking at the references section. So you'll notice that the references section, as it currently stands, cuts off in a funny way. It would be cool if we could just have the references be on a new page. If you ever want a page break in your PDF document, you can accomplish this as follows. Let's say we want a page break before references. Get yourself into a new paragraph and begin with a backslash and then a new page. Sure enough, references are now on their own page. Notice also that I gave a web link to the article referred to here. How's that web link produced? If you head back to the source document, you'll see that the name for the web link that the reader will see is in between two brackets, an opening bracket and a closing bracket. Immediately after it is the actual web link itself, and that's between an opening parenthesis and a closing parenthesis. So brackets contain the name that the reader will see for the highlighted web link. The parentheses contain the actual web address to which the reader will be taken. We finished our document for now, but I'd like to show you a couple of extra tricks. So I'm just going to add a new section here. First of all, I'd like to talk about how to get really nice looking tables. So you can see I've added some um, text in this final section on extra tricks. Let's knit it up and see what it looks like. So we got a pretty lovely looking two-way table with a nice caption and the table's numbered so I can refer to it in the text. Let's see how this was accomplished. Back in the source document, we see a code chunk 
the first line of code produces a two-way table, puts it in an object called my table. The next line of code calls the cable function from the knitter package. This function will have two arguments. First of all, the table that you'd like to pretty up. And secondly, an arg argument called caption. And the caption is specified in quotes. So that's how you get nice tables. Another issue is if you would like to change your picture size, your graph size. You don't necessarily want all your graphs to have the default size that you set when you set your output options. So let's say there's a particular graph you'd like to be a little bigger. Maybe this one here. All you have to do is head to your chunk options and select the height and width specifically for this chunk. Fig dot width equals perhaps 5. Fig dot height equal perhaps 5. Notice that I always have commas between my chunk options. And there's at least a space between the R and the first chunk option. If we were to knit this up, we'd see a slightly bigger figure. Sure enough, that figure was so big, it occupied an entire page. Let's review our chunks a little bit. We have our initial chunk that loads our packages and sets our chunk options for the rest of the document. That chunk includes its own special op option, include equals false. Other chunks, if they produce a graph, will include a fig.cap option so that your graph can have a caption. If a code chunk is going to produce a table, then instead of fig.cap, you will use the cable function on an object that's, that is, corresponds to your table, and the cable function will have a caption option that gives you the caption for that table. None of these code chunks show up because I had set echo equal to false globally when I set my chunk options. Of course, you can always change options for individual chunks. And remember that this can be done using a graphical user interface. To just touch the little cog at each individual code chunk, and under output, you can select what you would like that code chunk to do. That should get you started writing an R Markdown document.